want to know any more about Operation Christmas Child, come and see myself, um, and I would love to be able to share with you what's happening with that, but um, be prepared and, and eager and ready to, to come and look at how you can prepare one of those Operation Christmas boxes, and we'll share more about that with you next week uh, as well. Now, I wanted to share with you um, some great and exciting news, and so get your hands ready to give a clap, and that is that in our bulletin, you'll see the last couple of weeks, we've been asking for um, a minute secretary, and we've been asking that people will pray over who could do that. Now, we've had somebody come forward and say that they're happy to do it, and, and that is Alison um, Peterson, and she's going to give her a clap. We took it to the stewards on Monday. We had some very rigorous conversations about if, um, if you know, no, actually, no, we all went, yes. And so it's, it's great to have her on board and, and doing that uh, ministry uh, with us. Uh, I want to be able to share about our uh, uh, morning tea. After the church, we're doing morning tea out the back there, so make your way through up the ramp and out into the back there. And thank you for everybody who's been involved and in supporting this by your service in morning tea. Um, if you're on, and you'll see in our bulletin that there will be, a um, on here down the bottom, there's the notice of who's going to be on morning tea. So morning tea today is Colin, Maxine, Robbie and Wall. And next week is Serena, Tracy, Peter and Megan Kelly and Helen Lenigan. Um, can you please make sure you note that and look at that so that you know when you're on? But also, I want to share that I want you to, to continue to adhere to the fact that we want just to be able to use the biscuits and the coffee and tea that is supplied. And the desire that we have is that we want to be a church that is open for fellowship and, and community without f making other people feel pressure that they have to make and bake anything wonderful. So to create that culture, we have just wanted to supply the biscuits and the coffee and tea and make the big special thing the fact that we can communicate and talk with one another and have that fellowship. So can we, can we um, say yes to that, that we're just going to keep those biscuits um, as the primary part or the only part of eating? And, and if you'd like to bake and do all of that, that's wonderful. Invite me over and I'd love to eat it all, just not on the Sunday after church for morning tea. But now I'm going to contradict my own statement because next week... We are having our multicultural service. It's focused in Ephesians chapter 2, where um, through Christ, we, He broke down all the walls and the Jews and the Gentiles were coming together as one people under Christ. And I thought this would be an exciting time for us to celebrate the various cultures that we have in our church, but how we come together as one people under Christ. And so this is the week that we get to celebrate that. We've got some people coming and sharing a part of their culture through song or through language and, and through different different things. And so I encourage you to come along dressed up or with a symbolism of the cultural background that you have. And also, here's what I'm really excited about as well, bring something special for morning tea that symbolises your culture. Now, this is a once only, the pastor says so, um, but this is a once over, bring in a special morning tea that we can share and, and delight in the different cultures that we have in our church. And it's going to be a wonderful service um, next week. Now, I do believe that I have missed one of the bulletin, uh, one of the things that I was going to share. Um, but if you want to know what that is, come and talk to me afterwards. I'm sure I'll remember it. I didn't. I don't have it here. But um, it's wonderful. I, I thought this would be a great time for us to to come into prayer. That was the announcement that I had. Um, so you'll see that we've got a few people missing. Uh, Lisa Harding uh, and also uh, Emma uh, isn't here with us, and they're away on a, ki a, 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 a girls' camp trying to instill God's love and character into these young girls. And I think it would be powerful for us to be able to pray for them in the work of Scripture Union. Um, but also, let's be praying for our chaplains. Um, they're in the midst of some pretty hard times right now, um, as it looks like they're going to be getting pushed out of the schools from the role of chaplain. And so we think of you, Lynn, um, in, the, in the role that you do as well, and, and we want to be praying for the chaplains that we support and the chaplains in Queensland and beyond um, as this movement comes through. So let us pray. I'll give you a minute just to be praying for our chaplains um, and for Lisa and Emma as they do the camp, and then I'll just close this time off. Um, in prayer and yeah uh, Lynn come out we, we want to pray uh, for you and um, that would be great 
So you can stay here. We're going to pray for her, but let us just come to a time of personal prayer and silence, and then we'll come to a time of um, corporate prayer uh, together. Lord, we thank you for the way that you've equipped and enabled your people to share into schools through um, the love and the nurture that you bring through uh, our chaplains. And Lord, I I thank you for Lisa and Emma as they're off at this camp, um, instilling beautiful uh, things into these girls. Lord, I thank you for the work that they are are doing. and, And Lord, we pray for your wisdom and your love to be able to shine through them as they share with these young girls that you love them so deeply. Lord, we pray for life-changing events to happen there where people will come to know that they are valued, that they are loved, and they are beautiful on the inside and out because you created them that way. And so, Lord, we pray that you will just do something miraculous in the lives of these girls. Um, And if there's boys' camps happening too, Lord, we pray that that will happen as well. But, Lord, I also want to pray... Uh, right now for each of our chaplains. Lord, I pray for Lynn. I thank you uh, for the work that she does in Kelkey State School and within the university. Um, And Lord, I thank you for Lisa and for Emma and, and, and so many of the other chaplains within the Bundaberg region and beyond. And Lord, this is a hard time where uncertainty is in place. But Lord, I'm sure that the financial factors are struggles, but Lord, their hearts are for the children. And there's a feeling that they're not going to have the ability to, to speak into these young people's lives with the love of Jesus. And so, Lord, we pray that you'll intervene. We pray that you will create the space where God can be spoken through the love of these people into their lives of children. And, and Lord, so we just pray for that. But we pray for comfort and protection and mental strength in the midst of this time for our chaplains. And, and Lord, I pray that even in the midst of this uncertainty, Lord, we can hold on to your hope. Lord, we prayed this morning as we came together with the worship team, this, this song, Blessed Assurance, and truly is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. And Lord, you desire for us to hold on to your assurance and your hope, even in the midst of the hard times and the struggles. And so, Lord, I pray that you'll press that into the chaplains and for Lynn and, and, and for Lisa and, and, and for Emma and, 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 and others within this area. Lord, bless them in this, the midst of this time. Give them clarity and direction and vision of what you're going to call for them to do in the future, within the schools and beyond, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to come to a time now where we're going to take up our offerings. Uh, I'll ask Tantan and Nashe if you want to come and, and grab the offering bags to prepare. I'm just going to pray for that. And while they're taking up the offering, um, we're going to watch a, a little video clip. Hold on, Tantan. Um, we're going to watch a, a little video clip on, uh, from the Skit Guys as we do it. But let me pray. Hey, oh, Nashe, did you want to pray for the offering? You can say no. No, thank you. Okay, lovely. Gracious Father, I just want to pray that you will just use these finances to bless uh, your community here. Lord, use it for your glory within the church. Give us wisdom of how we are to use these resources uh, for the kingdom's purposes and extend the kingdom. Lord, we thank you that we are able to give with a heart of worship, giving back to you a portion of what you have given us. And, And Lord, I pray that we'll give with a cheerful heart but also with a prayer over these offerings that this will be used for your glory and for your glory only. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, boys. Off you go.
blessed assurance. Now's an opportunity for the kids to be able to run out and, and not, actually don't run, walk fast, but you get to go out to uh, kids' church with your leaders. Thank you, leaders, for all that you do. Um, and kids, we love having you here and, um, and seeing how Jesus is able to work through you. But while they're going up, I would love to be able to also invite Megan up on stage, Megan Kelly, um, as I get to interrogate, uh, uh, sorry, interview her um, this morning. Feel free, we'll jump up on, sit in these comfy chairs. microphone and and Megan's uh, on Alison's microphone from there. Uh, could I ask, is that door closed? Could I ask somebody just to, to close that door? Um, otherwise, as I talk really quietly, you may not be able to hear me very well. Um, but it's wonderful for you to be able to join with me up here, Megan. Thank you. We got to hear last month um, the story of how Christ came to meet with Peter and Oh, that was a, such a great testimony, a great and powerful way that we can see God working in people's lives. And, and I hear that you've got um, a marvellous testimony as well, not, not because you have anything drastic or extreme, but rather because Christ met you where you were, hey? And I believe that everybody's testimony who has come to see that Christ has found them um, has a wonderful, marvellous, miraculous testimony. Amen. You don't need to have one of the most outrageous stories that blows people's minds, but rather by Christ meeting you where you're at and your life being transformed, that is a miracle in itself. And so we look, for, look forward to hearing from you. So let me ask you, Megan, what was life like before you had met Christ? Okay. Um, well, probably I could start with saying that my testimony tax on to the end of Peter's, but if I just start, I was born in Goulburn, in New South Wales. Oh, New yeah. South Wales. Freezing cold. Okay, so I come from a non-Christian family, although back in the day it was considered right to, to appear to be religious, and so I was uh, christened in the Methodist Church and my mother was absolutely adamant that I would be confirmed in the Church of England Church, which I did. My father was in the Masonic Lodge. Um, at the time, um, my sister and I actually found under his bed a suitcase with all of his Masonic stuff in it. And we were peeking in there and we just thought it looked like voodoo. And, and basically, yeah, that's what it is. I'd just like to jump forward like about, I don't know how many years, but um, both Peter and I had a prayer healing release um, from any involvement that our parents or fathers had had with the Masonic Lodge. So um, I'll just now jump back to what my life was like. Um, I moved to Sydney when I was about 16 and um, I worked um, in a very big office. Uh, lots of girls there and we partied hard. Um, I can remember one of our parties being raided by the police. So if that gives you some idea of our parties, they were pretty wild and full on. Um, I met... Uh, Peter at a 21st birthday party when I was 17 and I'd actually arrived there with a blind date and this guy was in the army and there were a few army guys there. Yeah. <laughs> well, I hate to say that I, um, I, I jumped ship and I went home with Peter <laughs> but we had to make a fast getaway because there were a few army guys there. Um, four years later, we got married in the Catholic Church and much to uh, Peter's mother's um, um, I, I, 
not happy Jan. Uh, I was not a good Catholic girl. And, um, and then joining on from Peter's testimony where he said that our marriage was on the rocks, and yes, it was. So not too long after, probably a year or two later, and um, I had left emotionally. I just had not left physically. Um, and then we tack on to Peter's um, testimony where he had the um, motorbike accident. And he was in plaster from um, a thigh to toe. And I thought, well, I can't leave him now. I mean, what sort of a mongrel would leave uh, when your husband is in plaster, but once he's better, I'm going. And it's amazing then how God intervened and Peter went back to work, got involved with the group at work who were Christians. Peter became a Christian. I was mortified because I said to him, look, we've got enough trouble in our marriage without any of this rubbish. Uh, at the time, that was in the 70s, the Hare Krishnas were really big in Sydney and I just had visions of him with a shaved head and an orange dress, waving a tambourine on the street corner and it was my, like my worst nightmare. So I really had no idea what he was involved in. Uh, he then was quite involved with this Christian group and he said to me, Megan, we've been invited to a party with the Christians. I went, oh, okay. Well, let me tell you, it was nothing like my parties. <laughs> the police did not raid this one, I'm telling you. So um, they were all nerds. And I walked in there and this guy came up to me and he had a Bible that was sort of about the size of that speaker there. <laughs> he was carrying this big Bible with this big grin on his face and he said to me, good evening, sister. I went, sister? I'm not your sister, you moron. I've never seen you before. And then he said to me, and what's your latest verse? <laughs> what language are you speaking? And anyway, so... Um, I was smoking at the time. Well, man, I had to get out in the street and have about 50 smokes because this was just too much for me. And um, I came back in and then they decided that they'd have piano time. And, and not only did they have the Bible memorised, they had the hymn book memorised as well. And so they'd say, oh, let's sing number 47. Oh, yes, that's my favourite. And off they'd go. And I'd, oh, it was just too much. Anyway, um, then I got home from that and vowed and declared I was never, ever going to one of those things again. Then Peter came home and said, they're having another party. And I said, no chance. I am not going, not Anyway, he said, no, this one's going to be different. I said, well, it would sure want to be because that last one was a disaster. <laughs> so I went along, not very happily, but this was the night where Jesus really spoke to me. And uh, six men gave their testimonies. So just what I'm doing now. And they stood up and told what their life was like before, what happened when they met Jesus and what their life was like afterwards. And these six men were very different, and some rich, some poor, some educated, some not, some married, not, old, young, but they all had the same point in their journey where they came to that point where they realised that they did not have Jesus in their life and they needed to invite him in. I listened with great interest and I was really blown away. I always thought that I had to be like the Bible carrying nerd um, to become a Christian, but um, Jesus loves everybody and he died for us, whatever situation we're in. And that was the big turning point for me. 
I went home that night and I remember getting down on my knees at the foot of my bed and I, I prayed a prayer. And it's a really funny prayer when I look back on it. But I, I prayed something like this, Jesus, um, I know that I've done things wrong, like heaps of stuff wrong, but I want you to come into my life. But hey, don't come in too far because, you know, I don't want to be a nerd. Um, and I can just imagine Jesus rolling on the ground laughing um, at my prayer. Um, so I came under the Holy Spirit's conviction that night and, and it was God's promise and it was on the 9th of March 1974 that I was sealed by the Holy Spirit as a forever child of God. Amen. I prayed that prayer and I meant it with all my heart even as though my words were lame. Um, we then kind of went on the testimony circuit, I think because we'd been saved from such a worldly background that people in the churches really wanted to hear that um, non-Christians could be touched. Um, we joined a church. Uh, it was a great church, fantastic church. God began to heal our marriage uh, we joined the Navigators, um, they're an interdenominational group, and we started to memorise scripture. <laughs> Our journey then continued on of leading Bible studies. I was involved in special events for ladies' groups. We went to many, many conferences and we were hungry to learn. We just could not get enough when I was a new, newish Christian and at about this stage, we did a gifts test. And um, my gifts came out very weak in giving and faith, but they came out really, really strongly in two gifts. And one was discernment of spirits, and the other one was encouragement. And I believe that the Lord is using me still with these gifts. I didn't know what discernment of spirits was and I'll just tell you, just briefly, it's the ability to judge between truth and error. So that's kind of it in a nutshell. But it's having a hearing heart and getting on my heart what's on God's heart. If you remember that Solomon asked for wisdom and discernment and it's about making keen observations about things. It's matching people's body language with their words. And it's listening below what's being said. And I can remember as a new Christian, we were hungry. We went to so many meetings. And yet there were a couple of times when that spirit of discernment really kicked in. And we left because I knew that what they were saying was error. Peter then went on to theological college, so another worst nightmare in my life because I did not want to go there. The Lord and I had to struggle about that for about six months, but we finally went, and, um, and it was good. <laughs> um, we were in a very healthy church, and um, uh, then we went church planting, then um, Peter got started on all of his cancer journeys. Of course, we retired then through sickness. We went round Australia a couple of times with a motorhome full of Bibles and we delivered them to whoever we could at campfires. And now, getting up to the present, it's almost been 50 years um, since that 9th of March, 1974. Um, we have two daughters. Um, we prayed every day from when they were tiny little children that they would marry godly men. We didn't ask for Christians, we asked for godly men. And the Lord has honoured our lifetime prayers. Uh, they are both married to godly men who are leaders in their community and they're leaders in their homes. We have six grandchildren and look, by the grace of God, they're all walking with the Lord and they all love the Lord deeply. I've had the privilege of leading both of my non-Christian parents to the Lord. Both of them were on their deathbeds, 
both of them had had strokes, so I could communicate with each of them in a different way, but I know they made that decision. And uh, I'd like to say, uh, close by saying, I am thankful. Mm, wonderful. Yeah, give her a clap. I think I was supposed to ask you two more questions. I think you were, but I kind of rushed in, didn't I? But that's okay. But you can ask me if there's more questions. I'm going to ask you one more question. Okay. Actually, I still will ask you two more questions. Oh, okay. Well, one you is... have to answer, the other one I don't okay. really mind if you don't answer. Right. But the first, so the, the, the second question I'd love to ask you is, can you share um, a significant moment where you felt the presence of Jesus moving your life? Um, yes. Um, it was on our church planting um, venture, time. Um, we were praying about whether we should go. And because we were so happy in our church, we really didn't want to go. And, um, but Peter felt that the Lord was saying, we need to move on. Um, it meant that we had to leave our girls, one in Wagga, one in Newcastle, and we went to Tweed Head, so we were far flung. And we were staying in a... We'd been for the interview at the church, New Church, and we were coming home, and we stayed in a motel, and I had the most incredible nightmare, I mean nightmare, that I normally don't have. And... I felt the Lord was saying, this is, it was either don't go to that church or this is going to be very, very difficult. Um, I, I woke up screaming and sobbing and I said to Peter, we can't do this, we can't go. And he said, we don't have to. Um, and then on the way home in the car as we were driving, we started to talk about what we could do at this church and what sort of a ministry we could have. And so we started to become excited. And I think that the Lord was telling me this is going to be extremely hard. And I felt that the Lord really moved in a very significant message, and it was hard. We went to Tweed Heads. It's probably one of the darkest areas in New South Wales, if not, oh, you know, it's up around Nimbin and all of... We know that there's a lot of witches' covens up in that area and we were certainly moving into dark territory. At our first church camp we went to, we were up in this beautiful hinterland and I was standing at the windows looking out at coffee time and I was praying and I said, Oh, God, this is so beautiful. This is such a gorgeous area. It's so pretty. But unfortunately... I think I said something like, unfortunately, Satan rules. That's what I said. And I have heard a man behind me, and I know it was the Lord, said, this is what I want you to know. And I spun around to see who was talking, and there was no one there. So I turned back to the window, and I prayed the same prayer again, and again the voice, and it was God, this is what I want you to know. Mm. Yeah. Wow. Um, thank you for, for sharing that. Um, and, and in many times, in many ways, we have um, similar situations happening in our lives, maybe not in that same scenery, but rather God is calling us to do big things. Mm. And in many times, we have this sense of um, concern and, and anxiety within ourselves going, God, can I do this? Um, and, and I think we need to be listening out for God to speak because mm -hmm. he does want to speak to us in those opportunities. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, my reflection as I was driving here before I heard your testimony is I'm so thankful that God met you both and that you've been able to do the work that God has called you to do in your lives. You've been so powerful so far and God's going to do more in your lives. But the thing that hit me and, and impacted me was to reflect on the fact that it it all started by Peter's, um, people who worked with Peter, having a desire to share Jesus with him. 
Um, and, and, and that really impacted me that we need to be people who desire to make an imp- impact in people's lives around us as well. Um, and that's, you know, God used them. It was all God, but God used them and we want to be people and we should be desiring to be people to be used by God to make an impact in other people's lives as well. That's great. And my last question for you, Megan, is can I pray for you? I'd love to pray for you, and um, let us pray um, for Megan together. So, gracious Father, I thank you for Megan and her, her story. Lord, through the experiences of her life, even the, the reckless and outgoing parties that police came to, Lord, that was her story, that was her past, and that's brought her to be the woman that she is today. And so, Lord, I pray that you will just use um, her memories and her experiences uh, to be a blessing to you as she desires to go and share her faith with others so that they may know you as well. Lord, we thank you for her faith. We pray you'll continue to to strengthen her in her faith. Uh, Lord, I pray that you'll root and establish her um, in the love of Christ. And through that, Lord, I pray that she will just continue to extend that out to those who need to hear it, those who need hope, and those who need your assurance. Lord, we pray for your blessing over Megan and for Peter too. Uh, Lord, we pray for good health. We thank you that they've recovered now uh, from the flu and, and from COVID as well. And Lord, we pray that you'll continue to strengthen their bodies and enable them to be able to do your work within this community and beyond. We thank you, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Give her a clap as she hops down. It is so good when we hear brothers and sisters' testimonies. It strengthens our heart and it encourages us. And God's Word says He encourages us in 1 Peter 1, 8 to 10, where it says, Though you have not seen Him, you love Him. And even though you do not see Him now, you believe in Him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you, for me, we are receiving the end result of our faith the salvation of our souls. Marvellous, amazing. Would you stand with me and let's reflect on that salvation that is ours. You stood before creation, eternity. Spirit alive 
our Lord. We want to abandon ourselves to you afresh today. We offer our souls, Lord, to you. Take us and use us. But more than anything, build our relationship one with the other. You with us, Father. In the center of our being. We love you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Please, would you like to take a seat? I guess you're starting to realize why I love my wife so much. (laughs) She's a real blossom. We're uh, going to talk about grace this morning. Now, it's a little out of sequence because I got COVID when I was preparing this and Philip said, no, this is the, the passage I want you to preach on. So I'll continue on in Ephesians and we'll come back to Ephesians 2, 8 and 9. uh, Actually, 8 through to 10. So there's the clicker. Is it not turned? It's not turned on. Okay. Philip Yancey in his book, What's So Amazing About Grace, makes the point that grace is scandalous. You see, if a person murdered your son and you took things into your own hands and you went and you murdered that person, that would be revenge. If you were content to allow the law to handle the situation, to arrest the the offender, to it go before the courts and that he be sentenced, that would be justice. But if you were to take that son, that that person who murdered your son, and you took him into your own home, and and he lived with you, and you treated him completely like a son, that's grace. So... When we, when we talk about grace, we've got to understand that Jesus took us as the sinner that completely did the wrong thing against him and that he gave his own son that we might be brought into his household and treated like one of his children. That is scandalous. That's illegal. That goes against any form of judgment. It is a scandalous grace that God offers us. So let's read this passage this morning and let's see what we can glean from it. As for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sins in which you once used to live When you followed the ways of this world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived amongst them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh and following its desires. And like the rest, we were by nature deserving of wrath but God because of his great love for us God who is rich in mercy made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in our transgressions it is by grace 
you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that the, in the coming age he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from ourselves. It is a gift of God. Not because of works, so that no one, no one can boast. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared, prepared in advance for us to do. Let's pray. Father, we come to this passage and <laughs> it just blows our mind that you would do what you have done. That we can go free. The sinner can go free because Jesus paid the penalty. And not only that, but you take us into your family, that you raise us up with Christ and you give us that sort of future that we can look forward to. Not when we die only, but right now that we can be people who, who are in your family and, Lord, you have given us tasks to do that you prepared beforehand. And, Lord, we ask you that you would give us your Holy Spirit, that you would guide us, that we might fulfil being a part of your commission. For, Lord, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. When we think of what God has done for us, we must firstly understand where we have come from. Jesus, uh, Paul digs deep and starts to talk to the people and present the evidence for what God has done. He talks about as for you. Now, when he talks about as for you, he's talking to the Ephesian church. The Ephesian church um, it came from a background of absolute idolatry, of every sort of sexual and immoral perversion, um, they worshipped the, the uh, goddess Artemis, which is in Roman is Diana. It's the same, same god. Um, they, th this was, th their temple was at Ephesus. It was probably one of the bigger temples in the ancient world. Um, the influence of that temple went right out across the the Roman Empire, um, you notice that the girl in Philippi was fortune-telling by spirit, uh, by Numa Pythona, which is the spirit of the serpent. You, you don't get that in the English, but if you look at the Greek, it's clear that, that this serpent spirit can be traced right back to this temple. And so you can understand the influence that, the, that she had. It, 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 Diana or Artemis was, it was a statue of a woman um, covered in many breasts. So that the idea was that she was the goddess of the wild, the goddess that, um, the, of the animal life and that gave life to every being. And so... What we're seeing here is, is a goddess that basically encapsulates your whole life. And so when Paul says, this is, this is what you were like, 
You came out of that atmosphere. You know the sexual perversions and the, the drunkenness and the orgies and everything that you're involved with. With these fertility religions, um, uh, temple prostitution was always a part of that. The idea was that if you go have sex with a prostitute, it reminds the god or the goddess of fertility to make you fertile, to make your land fertile to make your family fertile. So this is the sort of uh, thing that we're dealing with. But Paul digs a little deeper. And he, said, and he says, all of us once lived like that. All of us lived amongst them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our flesh, and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were, des um, we were by nature deserving wrath. Here is a Jewish man, a religious man, who is saying, we're all in it. We've all done this. You know, we we're all, we're, we're all have this death that is within us, our dead spirit. You see, when, when Adam and Eve sinned, they lived physically, they lived emotionally, but they were spiritually dead. After, the, after they disobeyed God, their spirit, their relationship with God died. And so he's saying that it doesn't matter whether you come from the worst background or it doesn't matter whether you come from a church background. Your spirit is dead. You were born dead. When Adam sinned, he died. When we are born, we inherit that, that part of us where our spirit is dead. And so... So, it, so it's not only the pagan people out there, and we live in a very, and, and what is becoming even a more pagan culture, but it's also the people in the church that he's writing to. And he said that be, if before Christ that we were dead. I wonder if he, if he thought about... Um, the, the uh, teaching of Jesus, he said, there, there is two paths. One path is wide. It's easy to live that way. You just live in your own intellect and live in your own way you want to do things. And, and the pathway is well-trodden, well-trodden. But that path leads to death. He said, but there's another path. There's a path that's narrow. It's hard to walk that path. You know, it takes discipline. It takes sacrifice. But the end result is life. And so he, he puts before us two paths in Matthew chapter 7. which The idea is to, to do a little bit of self-analysis what path are you on? For some of us, I guess our Christianity has been like a like a uh, hopping on a train. <clears throat> you you bought a train at Sydney Central Station. About three o'clock. As the train races across New South Wales, it's starting to get dark. You go into the dining car and you have your dinner. By the time you get back, the porters have, um, have created a bed for you and they've made up the bed. It's very comfortable. And you go to bed at night. You sleep through the night and in the morning you realise you're in South Australia. Now you don't know when you cross the border. And so the, for us that 
have grown up in a church, maybe there's never been a point in your life where you've actually said, at this point I made a commitment to Christ. At this point I was saved. It's been like a, 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 a journey, you know, and, and you know for sure that you're saved. But you're, ne- you're not actually quite sure when that happened. You know that you were that at some stage you were not saved, but now you know you are saved. And and just the same as the train crosses from New South Wales to South Australia while you were asleep, you just actually can't pinpoint that particular time. We've heard a testimony from Megan and last month from me where we actually were confronted with the gospel. We were confronted with that fact that Jesus died for our sin, that we had to make a decision to follow him or not, and we made that decision. And so there, so there was a point in our life where we could actually say, this is the point. Back in 1973, for, for both of us, that, that we actually made that commitment to follow Christ and now we know we are saved. So there's, so there's different backgrounds to, to each of us. We, we understand that, that w- when these things happen, that, that something has changed in our lives and Paul is is talking about the love of God. He's talking about the mercy and the grace of God as he draws us into his kingdom and he makes us his children. Incredible mercy and love um, that, that comes. Now, the sort of thing that Paul's talking about when he starts to say... But, but God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. He, he's, talking, he's talking about something that is sort of foreign to us. That it, it's, it's a love that we can't really grasp because it is so great. It's, it's a, a, a grace that draws us and we don't understand the full implications of that. You know, um, maybe Paul was thinking back to when he spent those couple of years with Peter, a oh, couple of weeks with Peter and, and a couple of years in Damascus and, and just studying what the scriptures said. And maybe Peter told him about a parable. You know, the, there was Jesus, and Jesus told this parable about, uh, and it's one of three parables. There's a lost sheep. And, and, and the reason that Jesus told this parable was that act, actually the theologians of the time were gathered around Jesus and and here's Jesus sitting at a table with sinners and tax collectors. Now the theologians of his day were just appalled that a teacher would possibly connect with such people. And so he he, he told the story of a lost sheep. And and sheep, sheep never come back to the fold. You've got to go get them. You've got to put them on your shoulders and you've got to bring them back. They can never find their own way home. And then he told, told the story of a, lost, a woman with a lost coin and, and she started sweeping out, out the house and, and trying to find this coin. Now, some have suggested that this coin was so valuable because it was a part of her dowry. And so it was important that she find it. And so she searched around and she rejoiced when she found it, said, come, come and have a party. I found the coin that was lost. But then he gets on to this parable of the lost son. It 
it's a, it's, it's a, it's a difficult passage because it seems to be so wrong, so unjust. It's, it's almost like that, that Jesus is, is really just going so much deeper with these theologians that were standing around him. And he said, you know the story. He said, the, and I just want to bring out just a, a little bit more out of the story. This son goes to his father. There was two sons. The younger one went to the father. And he said, give me my inheritance. Now, in the Jewish society, this, this was so wrong. And people would have been... You, you would actually stone this guy for such a sentence. He, basically what he's saying is, Father, I want to be out of your responsibility. I don't want to come under that anymore. I don't want to work for you. I don't want to be a part of this family. I want to do my own thing. And he said, and Father, as far as I'm concerned, you're dead. Just give me the money and I'm off. Now, in this society, probably the son was the one who got the cash portion of the inheritance. The eldest son, and he gets twice the inheritance. You realise that from the Old Testament. He gets twice the inheritance. We'll come back to that. But this son takes the money. This is how the, the cash flow of the farm works. He was actually saying, Father, I don't care that you're going to be bankrupt from now on. I don't care that farming is going to be so hard that what you've put away for your old age, um, I'm taking. But Because as far as I'm concerned, you're dead. And so the father gives him the money and off goes the son. But here's, here's the strange bit. I don't know how he would have escaped being stoned, but because it's such a close society that we're talking about that when you when you you've got to understand a patriarchal society. You see, when when the when the father was the patriarch of the family, he held the family together. It was his job to protect the family. If any of the family got into trouble, it was his job to bring them back. Um, if if uh, any disaster happened, he was the one that came in for protection. That's the father's house. It's in Hebrew, Beth Ab, the father's house. In their society, when the eldest son was given twice the inheritance, the rest of the sons would be going, fantastic, now our brother will take care of the family. It's his responsibility to take care of everything. He now becomes Bethab, the father's house. And so Jesus continues with the story, he says, while the son was still a long way off, the father looked up. Maybe he was always searching the horizon. Maybe he knew the walk of his son, you know, the, the stance of his son. He noticed his son way off and he ran to him. Now, older blokes don't run. Hips, knees. You know, you know the story. But because of their old age, and to show wisdom and stature, they never ran. This father picks up his tunic and he runs to the son. And he puts his arms around him. He's probably stunk of pig. Puts his arm around him. Says, bring, bring the the sandals and put sandals on this poor boy's feet bring my best robe the father's robe put the robe around his shoulders and 
and put the, the family ring back on his hand. Scandalous grace. Absolutely scandalous. You see, what should have happened with this, with this, this, uh, with this son is that there was a ceremony called Kazaza. And Kazaza was... Uh, you've got... You've got Torah, which is the law. Then you've got Talmud, which is basically the rules for, for, um, uh, for obeying the law. But one of these Talmudic ex, um, ceremonies was that if a son dil, uh, um, lost the inheritance through his own fault, you know, stupidity. Then they would bring the son into the centre of the village and the whole village would, would gather around him and they would put him on his knees and they would get a jar of grain and they would smash it in front of him. And then he would be excluded from the village and from the family from then on. Can you imagine living in Israel where every person is connected with Bethab, the father's house, with their village, and this person is left without a village, without, without a family? That's what should have happened. But somehow in the story, Jesus tells the story that no, it's by grace that you've brought, that you've been brought in. Unbelievable what God has done for us. So let's listen to the to the words that Paul starts to use. In, he said, you were dead. Now, dead people can't do anything. He said, you were dead, but God. You see, it can only be from God. Dead people can't do a thing. It has to be, come from God's side. It had to be something that God did that brought him in. He said, but God, in his great Love. It's he reaches out, Bethab, the father's house. He reaches out. He gathers. He brings back in, and he and he loves us. And he said, "Who is rich in mercy? Mercy is that we don't get." what we deserve okay we don't get what we deserve god has it's he he can do this because he has laid the penalty of our sin on jesus it's it's um it's unbelievable mercy and then he said it's by grace Grace is that I get what I don't deserve. Mercy, I don't get what I do deserve. Grace, I don't get what I do deserve. And it's for you. Not only for you, but he has raised you up that he has set you in heavenly places with Christ. Unbelievable that we, we, we're not just down, down in some, some great crowd of Christians, but we are all lifted up where we're with Christ. That we, it's, it's almost like Jesus comes and he wraps his arms around us 
So the father doesn't actually see us anymore, doesn't see the, the poor pitiful people that we are. But Jesus wraps his arms around us. When the father looks at the son, it's the son that he's looking at and we're, with, we're in the son. It's unbelievable. If you, you, you come to the, to, the, to the understanding of how, how is it possible that people think that they can earn their salvation? How is it possible? Isaiah 60, um, yeah, 64 says that even your good works are as filthy rags. You know, think of the most polluted pieces of clothing that you could wear. And he said, that's what your good deeds are like before God. So don't come before God saying, I think I've done the right thing. I think I've been good enough. Job, even Job, one of the first books of the Bible, says, how can a man be righteous before a pure God? How is that possible? So when we pray for non-believers, if they are dead, and it's only that God can bring new life, how do we pray for them? Well, the way I pray is that, Lord, take the blindfold from their eyes, take the veil from their mind, and give them a heart. To believe because that's the only way because the Bible says that we are veiled that we can't understand unless God is doing something through the Holy Spirit and he's, he's actually drawing the person he's helping the person to understand the depth of love of grace of mercy and drawing that person into a relationship with him. So where do we go from here? It's important that we realise that God has not saved us so that we can work for him. It's important that God didn't save us because he's creating a labour force. But he saves us and, and brings us into such a relationship of love that he turns our hearts that we want to be involved in his great commission. You see, it, it's a little division, isn't it? it it's, it's a little heart division. One way, we are always guilt-ridden trying to repay God for what he has done. The other way is that we freely give ourselves in service for the kingdom. Just a little change. And so how, how can we give ourselves in service for God? Well, one of the when we talk about discipleship, whoops, wrong way. One of the things is it's not to do good works, but because we are saved. The first thing that we need to look at is where has God planted you? In this being involved with him in his kingdom, where has God planted you? This church? Maybe in a retirement village. Maybe a block of flats. Maybe a residential block. Where has God planted you? What are you who are the people that you know? There are questions that that we need to really sit and think about and say, hang on, God, in your great commission, where am I? 
Secondly, what sort of a personality has he given you? Has he given you an extrovert where you're happy to talk to many, many people or an introvert where you're happy just to be working behind the scenes? I think, I think in this one, um, if you're an extrovert and you're locked away in a back room, you will become very frustrated. If you're an introvert and you're expected to go out and always be talking to people, you would find it great, a great stress. So you need to understand what is the personality that God has given me in this great calling to be with him in his great commission. Second, thirdly, what is the gifting that he has given me? Has he made me an evangelist where I go out and I always talking to people about the gospel? Or has he made me more of an administrator where I'm behind, behind the scenes and, and doing the work that needs to be done there? Maybe he's called me to be an RE teacher or work with children in, in the back room here or to be a chaplain. Um, what, what, is, what is he calling me to? Or is he calling me to administration? Is he calling me to quietly clean the church? Is, is he calling me to do all of the back, the back behind the scenes sort of stuff? You know, the, there's a list and it's not exhaustive by any means. But in, one, in Romans 12 and 1 Corinthians 12, there is a list of gifts. That's probably a good place to start. Secondly, do a gifts test. Um, I have gifts test if you want to do one. Um, and probably, yep, you've got one too. Okay, Philip's got gifts test. That, that he can, uh, where you can understand your gift. The third one is just as important. What's your passion? What really gets you excited? What gets you up in the morning? What's your passion? Maybe it's, maybe it's being out in a sporting field. You know, how many, I know so many people that have been won to Christ through a soccer team because there was Christians in that soccer team. Or uh, at the moment, I'm trying to work with Christian surfers, with, with um, Pacific surfers. And I'm also involved in the sailing club, just trying to meet people and it, it just broaden my base of, of, of friends. Because I found that actually I was spending too much time in our unit. You know, so what's, what, put your passion, you know, it, if, you, if we get your location, your personality, your gifting, and your passion, if we get that right, then you will be energised to keep working in that field. You won't get burnt out. You'll always be um, thinking of new ways of doing things. So it's important. Let's, let's go back to where I started. Are you here this morning and you're on a journey towards Jesus? You haven't made that decision yet. You realise may, maybe uh, uh, the, <laughs> when it talks about that you, in the, the, the way you used to live, following the ways of the world and the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those that are disobedient. Yeah, that's, you say, yeah, that's me. That's me. Then maybe it's a divine appointment right here this morning. If the Holy Spirit is actually drawing you in his heart, in your heart, And you realise that you need to make that commitment. Then when you make that commitment, it's a done deal. 
It's only when the Holy Spirit works and we say yes. It's a done deal and you have the gift of eternal life. I, I just want to give you a, um, a chance this morning to make that commitment. And so I, I'm, I'm going to pray a prayer. And this is the prayer that we'll, we'll pray. Father in heaven, I realize that I have sinned against you. I believe that your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, paid the penalty for my sin. I now repent from going my own way. And I ask Jesus to come into my life, forgive my sin. And I give my life under your lordship. Thank you for giving me the gift of eternal life. If that's you this morning, don't let this moment pass. Please don't let this moment pass. You may not get another opportunity. So let's pray. I'll pray this prayer again. Father in heaven, I realise that I have sinned against you. I believe that your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, paid the penalty for my sin. I now repent from going my own way and I ask Jesus to come into my life, forgive my sin and give me life and, and, and I give my life under your lordship. Thank you for giving me the gift of life. Amen. But I also want to talk to you about those that have grown up in the church. You know, it's, it's been that journey. Remember, we, we spoke about getting on at Central. And, and look, we are not doubting your salvation. Okay? What, what I want to lead you in is a prayer to hammer the stake in right now because things are going to get bad and temptation's going to come and the evil one is a really nasty piece of work and he will hit you at your lowest point. So th this is the opportunity to whack in a stake and say, at least from this point, because... Because it's got to be bound in the word of God. It can't be bound in your feelings. You can't say, oh, I feel saved. I think I'm okay. I've grown up in the church. I haven't got up to the nasty stuff. But this is an opportunity for you to just, at least from now, you can point to Satan and say, Revelation 3.20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and eat with him and he with me. It's, it's just you whack the stake in that verse and you say, I've, I've grown up in the church, but at least at this point, I know, based on the word of God, that I have the assurance of salvation. We're not doubting your salvation. All we're doing is building the assurance of your salvation. So let me pray again. And if, if this is you and you just need to, yeah, look, uh, one thing. Peter Jensen, the Archbishop of Sydney, just retired. Baptised as a baby in the Anglican Church, part of, the, part of their tradition, baptised in the Anglican Church, in 1959 at the Billy Graham Crusade, came forward to make a commitment to Christ. So if baptism saved him, what's he doing there? You see, baptism is, is an encouragement to bring you into the church to be an attender but the commitment is for salvation so there's a difference was Peter Jensen the Archbishop of Sydney wrong 
or was something happening in his heart that said, yeah, I, 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 each of us needs to make that personal commitment. So let me pray for you. You can, it's the same sort of prayer, a little different. And pray along with me. Father in heaven, I have always believed in you and that your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, paid the penalty for my sin. To be sure of my salvation, not based on feelings, but on your firm word, I now ask Jesus to come into my life. Forgive my sin. And I give my life under your lordship. Thank you for giving me the gift of eternal life. If that's a commitment you've made here this morning, would you go and in your Bible, turn to Revelation 3.20 and write today's date. So at least you say to Satan, it's based on the word of God. It's not based on my feelings. You know, I've... Somewhere along the line, I became a Christian, but now I'm putting a stake in right here. Because John wrote, and this is the testimony that God gave us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. He who has the Son has life. He who is not the Son of God has not life. I write this to you who believe in the name of the Son of God that you may know you have eternal life. We want you to know it's the foundation for any ministry. Let's pray. Father, thank you. Um, Lord, that some of us have come face to face with the gospel. It's been so confronting to realise your love and your grace. And for others, and, and probably most of us, we're, we've grown up in the church, never gone up to the ta really tacky stuff, but realised that we're born spiritually dead and, and to add to that, we've sinned ourselves. And Lord, at some stage, you, you came into our lives and, and Lord, we firmly believe Lord, give us that assurance of salvation that, firms a, that forms a firm foundation for our relationship with you. Never doubting. Always believing. In Jesus' name, amen.
so that you may have great endurance and patience and giving joyful thanks to the Father who has qualified you and me to share in the inheritance of his holy people in the kingdom of light. For he has rescued us from the dominion of darkness and brought us into the kingdom of the Son he loves in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. This grace is so amazing. Make sure that you experience personally what that means. It is an exceedingly amazing gift given to you and I simply because we have a God who loves us. Praise His holy name. I just encourage you to walk by faith this week. Open up the word and let it just pour into your life the truth about the God who loves you. Bless you. Let's go out and enjoy some fellowship together.